Hello, Whovians, and welcome to my latest Doctor Who review, where today I review Doctor Who, The Invisible Enemy, starring Tom Baker and Louise Jameson. Okay, so, uh, The Invisible Enemy. This is the second story of season 15 of Doctor Who, which is Tom Baker's fourth season. And the basic plot of this story is as follows. A three-man rocket crew are nearly done with their mission to Titan base until a course change puts the rocket in the path of a strange cloud in space. By the time they arrive, they have come under the control of a sentient virus which threatens the galaxy. When the TARDIS picks up an emergency message, it flies into the cloud, infecting the Doctor. To save himself and the others, he must undertake a dangerous journey. Okay, there we go. That is the basic plot of The Invisible Enemy. Now... It is rather convenient that I'm reviewing this story when I am, because currently, as I'm reviewing this, um, the world is basically still in lockdown. Well, the UK is, anyway. I, as a lot of you probably know, I'm from England, and our country is currently in lockdown uh, due to a virus. The coronavirus, to be exact. So, um, yeah, I just find it rather ironic that I'm coming to review this particular Doctor Who story at this current time. But, uh, yeah, um, hope everybody's staying in and staying safe and staying well. And it's good to know we are slowly turning the tide, <laughs> albeit very slowly, but uh, yeah, fingers crossed, we'll make it through. Anyway, uh, The Invisible Enemy. Well, I actually loved this story. I thought this story was excellent, an excellent Doctor Who story. Um, it was just so imaginative. I loved the imagination behind this story. And this story kind of takes inspiration from a film called The Fantastic Voyage, in which people are shrunk down to a microscopic size and go inside someone's body. In this case, um, the Doctor and Leela are cloned, and then the clones go inside the Doctor's mind to fight off the nucleus, the um, the, the the virus uh, virus nucleus, which is interesting. So in that sense, there's a lot of adventure to the story, and when we get inside the Doctor's head, and we see all those sets and everything, and we're passing through the Doctor's brain and and neural waves. I mean, just the design of this story is really clever and really imaginative and just very creative. It's just, it's just so much fun to look at and it's just very vibrant, very colourful and it's, um, it's, it's wonderful to look at. And I like the story. I like the idea of the, the virus which is infecting people, although it's like an alien virus and then they want to come out and they decide, they then manage to get out of the Doctor's body <laughs> when the clones are beamed back. And then the Nucleus tries to, uh, with with his swarm, try to destroy Titan, which is interesting. Um, also, this story is the introduction of K-9. Yay! K-9, the little tin dog who uh, <laughs> works for the Professor um, Matthias, I think his name is. Um, Professor uh, Marius. No, not Matthias. Sorry, Marius. Professor Marius. Yeah, um, he, ha he owns K-9. He built K9 because on Earth he actually has a real dog, but he couldn't bring his real dog with him, so he has the robot dog K9. And obviously, at the end of the story, K9 goes off with the Doctor and Leela, which is nice. But uh, and of course, John Leeson providing the voice of K9. I mean, isn't he cute? He's just this kind of cute little robot dog. He's got he's the, only the first mark of K9, but he's like a dog supercomputer. <laughs> he's really clever and he's he doesn't have any emotional um, attachments, but. He he's very obedient and he's just cute. He's just very cute and he does he does quite contribute quite a lot in the story. I, before I um I watched the story, I wasn't sure how much K9 was going to do in the story, but thankfully he gets plenty to do. He's introduced in the second part of the story, I think. And then um he's pretty much involved until the end. The doctor's not actually in the story as much as he has been in previous stories, but um that's okay. I mean, Tom Baker does give a great performance, of course. The doctor when when he's sort of becoming possessed and he's being taken over by the virus and then he's kind of bed bound for a lot of the story and then he has to take he has to play a clone version of himself as well so he still has a lot to do but um Leela <laughs> takes charge in this story um Louise Jameson is brilliant as Leela this is her best performance so far <clears throat> she is phenomenal in this story I like I like how she um she keeps having um this, this, you know, conflict with the Doctor. Well, not conflict, a sort of argument with, with the Doctor about, you know, should we just blow it up or should we just not blow it up? And, you know, she's 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 a fighter, she's a warrior, but the Doctor's not always 
you know, he's not always prone to agree with violent <laughs> actions, so there's a bit of tension there, but but generally she and the Doctor have come a long way, and there's there's a nice bond there, and she really takes control here, and there's a lot of action in this story, and Leela's at the forefront of it, so Louise Jameson, fantastic as always. She's a fantastic companion. Uh, the supporting cast are all very good. Um, we've got the main, one of the main bad guys, Loeb, who gets infected with the virus. Michael Sherd plays him. He's very good. Safran, played by Brian Grellis. He's also good. Mika, played by Edmund Pegg. I think that's how you say it. Um, he's very good. Sylvie, played by Jay Neal. Very good. Yes, the voice of the nucleus, actually, is John Leeson, would you believe, who voices K-9. So, um... Two very distinctive voices, very interesting. His his vocal work is is excellent <laughs> in this story. Um, Parsons played by Roy Herrick is good. I mean, most most of the of the supporting cast are very good. I'm, I'm not going to list all of them. Of course, Professor Marius I should mention, played by Friedrich uh, Jaeger or Jaeger. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but he's um, he's like a German. <laughs> I think he's German anyway. He he kind of has a hint of a German accent in his character, but um, he's quite a nice character. It's sad when he gets taken over by the virus. And the makeup effects for this story are phenomenal. When we see the doctor, especially on, on the doctor, when he's lying down on the on the hospital bed and his face is becoming more sort of, he, he has like, um almost, almost looks like snake skin. It's like shedded snake skin on his face. And then he's got hair, you know, <laughs> going coming out of his hands and whatnot. And his body just starts to really become infected by this thing. And uh, I'm sorry, I know that's a bad description, but if you look at images of this story, you'll see it's really quite freaky. And then all the others have, like, um, silver stuff around the eyes, and then they get hair around the eyes as well. It's really freaky. And the Doctor's actually the host of this virus because of his brain, because he's intelligent, because he's very intelligent, and they want to use that to help <laughs> to help find ways of spreading the virus. Um, so there's, there's just so much creativity, so much imagination, and that's what I love about Doctor Who in this particular story, is that there is just so much creativity. The script is phenomenal. Whoever wrote the script, uh, let me get the list up, sorry. Uh, Bob Baker and Dave Martin, very good writers, they did a great job with this story. I really do like the script, and I think it's a very strong thriller as well. The, the first uh, couple of parts, before we get to the hospital, um, the Doctor... And Leela are in, on are encountering the um, the three astronauts who get infected. I think they're well. Sorry, the three astronauts, but yeah, the three guys who get infected. They they're having to deal with that. And I think the sets and production design for this story are fabulous. I mean, as I've already talked about when they go into the Doctor's mind, but um, the set of the space station and the spe the, the, spe the sets of the space station and the sets of the hospital are really good. And it looks like money well spent, as far as I'm concerned. Also, there's quite a lot of model work in this story. There's a lot of model work. Like, particularly when we see, like, the ship landing on the space station, you know, it flying into space. Obviously, they've taken out the wires in post-production. But it looks very... It looks very convincing for its time. However, what doesn't look so convincing... Unfortunately, there's a couple of issues I have with this story. There's uh, a couple of green screen shots which do look very dated very dated. I know it's it's natural, it's going to happen, it is what it is, but even for the time, it is very fake. Um, there's a moment when they're walking through the Doctor's brain, there's things going behind them, there's like a, it's, 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 it's kind of like the time vortex, but it's not quite, it's like, it looks like there's things flying in the background and the Doctor and Leela are walking forward and behind them, you can see where they've keyed out the green screen and you can see it on them as well. And it's, I know this, that's not a very good description, but if you watch the story, you know what I'm talking about. It's it's in, I think, the third part of the story. And, uh, yeah, so that could have been cleaned up a little bit, but I understand they're on a limited budget, but even for their standards, it is a little bit fake. Uh, <clears throat> also, when we finally meet the nucleus, <laughs> the, the, the nucleus monster, I, I gotta say, the design of the nucleus monster, for me, is just too damn silly for its own good. It's, um, it's basically a giant shrimp, and he has to be moved around by the other, you know, the, the three guys that are operating him. Like, he can't, I mean, when we first see him, he's covered over with a blanket. We just see his arm, and he's talking like this. He has a, a very evil voice. Ah. <laughs> and um, then, when he gets out into the real world, out of the Doctor's body, he actually, um, he actually is, is being operated by 
by those people. Um, so it, it just looks a bit silly to me. And I know it's only a minor thing to complain about. I just don't think it's... It doesn't look as scary as I think it wanted to. Um, to me, it just looks ridiculous that he looks like a shrimp. <laughs> it's like a giant shrimp. Um, so, you know, I, I think they could have maybe done something more to make him even more scary. But, yeah, it just looks like a, a giant shrimp. So it doesn't really have too much of an effect as far as I'm concerned. And um, uh, the direction by Derek Godwin is very good. I must say the direction is, is really good. The pacing is flawless. It moves very briskly for a four-part story. It keeps going. It never stops. It never loses momentum. And that is what I appreciate. That is what I really, really appreciate. Because it's so easy with Doctor Who <laughs> to, to, to slow down and have loads of talking. But this story, there's so much that happens. It keeps on moving. It really keeps on moving. And I, I can't really, <laughs> I can't thank it enough for that. And obviously we have the new TARDIS as well. Um, apparently the original TARDIS that they had uh, in, the pre in the previous season, apparently that um, set was damaged. So they made a new one. And fair enough, you know, it's okay to change the TARDIS every once in a while. I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Um, and I guess the music is good. I mean, for what it is, there's some very good music. But um, this is a really good story. This is a really, really good story. And a great story for Lilo as well. This is one of, this is probably Louise Jameson's best performance so far. Um, and it's a, and it's a great introduction to K9. Yay, K9. And hopefully he will be in more of the stories of this season. One more thing I forgot to mention, actually, before I do my rating, is um, the only thing I don't understand is how can K9 get the virus? He's a robot tin dog. How, how, do, how can they transfer the virus to him and then he just suddenly regenerates? Like, what? Like, like, he just, his brain, his, like, his system suddenly reboots and regenerates and the virus is now gone? Huh? What? I don't really get that. That was done in a, such a flash. It, it didn't, they didn't really explain that. Um, I thought that could have been done. And obviously, Leela being immune, um, helps with the Doctor when they go inside because they've cloned Leela. So, that allows the, the, the nucleus to be, to be extracted from the Doctor, uh, which I thought was quite clever, actually. Um, <clears throat> but I, I didn't understand how K9 got the virus and how he could just get rid of it like that and just reboot it out of his system. A um, little bit strange to me. So overall, I'm going to give this one a very strong 9 out of 10. Yeah, I was very tempted to give it a 10. I was very tempted, but then I thought about that and I thought, no, there's a couple of quibbles I have with it. But generally, this is a really good story. And if you haven't seen it, do watch it. And it is convenient given the coronavirus pandemic at the moment. But uh, yes, so anyway, enough talk about viruses. Um, on to the next story. The next story, which is the image of Fendal, which is the third serial of season 15. So uh, stay tuned for my review of that. And until next time, see ya.